Before we uh, jump into our message this morning, a couple items of family business I'd like to just uh, chat with you just a little bit about. The first is it's been a few weeks since we communicated with you about Ted Vaughn's uh, departure as our uh, Director of Contemporary Worship. And we've had some questions and some conversations with many of you, and our session is responding to some of those questions uh, via letter this week. So look for that in the mail. Uh, please read it, and, um, and uh, we'll continue on together and trust God together. The other thing I wanted to share with you is, uh, is the results of our pledging. This is kind of a, a strange time in our world to ask people to commit to giving more or giving for the first time. And we very intentionally, during the message series in January, uh, talked about giving and committing ourselves, uh, bringing those before the Lord. And, you know, honestly, I wasn't quite sure it was going to happen. I encouraged people to just do whatever. I mean, put any number down. Just begin to commit yourself to giving. <clears throat> and um, two, two facts about giving this year are pledging. Uh, number one, the total dollar amount of giving uh, pledging was actually down over last year. And that's understandable given the economy. But the encouraging news is that we increased the number of people who pledged by 20 families or individuals from 411 to 430 some. And I just think that's a tremendous step of faith for people to step out in these times and to say, regardless of the amount, I'm going to begin giving in a planful way. And I just say, praise the Lord. I think that's, that's awesome. And it reminds us uh, today as we look at God's word that God calls us together in community to grow together. That there are opportunities for us to be stretched and to grow in our understanding of who God is and how God has called us to live because we are together. In this series, this winter, leading up to uh, Easter, <clears throat> we're looking at this theme of better together, that it's not good for us to be alone, that God calls us into community together. And today I want to look at two passages that help us uh, with some images of what growth looks like. A few weeks ago we shared with you that, that we grow uh, by, uh, in 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 some sense, we grow individually. It's important for us as followers of Jesus to establish personal spiritual practices where we are committed to solitude with God, alone, time alone, quiet before God, that we're in His Word on a regular basis, that we engage in prayer, of prayers of thanksgiving and petition for our own lives and people that we love, that we're coming before God to pray, to be quiet, to read His Word. If we're not doing that, we're not growing spiritually. But God also calls us to grow together. And there's two passages I want us to uh, take a look at and see the images that God gives us for what growth looks like. First, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. And as I'm reading this, you might circle or underline words that, that speak to you of what it looks like to grow spiritually. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. What are some phrases, words, in that scripture passage, in that paragraph, that speak to you of what it looks like to grow spiritually? What are some phrases that you saw? Pardon? In him. To be in Him. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, that... Paul's image of being in Christ, to be found in him. What, what, what else did you see in the passage? Firmly rooted, this, this uh, image of a tree planted with, with roots that go deep, uh, both to gain nutrients and to provide stability. Uh, deeply rooted. What else do you see? What's another phrase? 
with thankfulness. There's something that happens on the inside of us and there's some evidence on the outside of us. What, what else do you see? To live your lives in Him, right? To live in Him. Rooted and built up. Encouraged. Made strong. Then the second passage from Romans 8, 29. For those God, for those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Scripture tells us that the goal of our lives is to become more and more like Jesus, to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Like Play-Doh that's squeezed through a mold, our lives are conformed, shaped, molded, to become more and more like Jesus. Growth takes place both individually, and together. And today I want to share with you four ways that I believe we grow together. We are meant to grow together first by being examples to each other. We are meant to grow together by being examples to each other. Being examples or modeling faith is uh, uh, a, a significant New Testament image of discipleship. When Jesus called the disciples to follow him, he meant that literally, that the disciple and the rabbi would walk together, they would live their lives together, that Jesus could say to the disciples, come and follow me. Not just geographically be in the same place that I am, but follow after my footsteps. Watch what I do, listen to what I say, and then do what I do and say what I say. This is a deeply rooted image of discipleship in the New Testament, that Jesus calls the disciples to follow after him, to watch his behavior, and then to become like him. And we understand that as Jesus, the Son of God, saying that to his disciples. And it seems almost arrogant for the Apostle Paul to say the same thing to those who are watching him. So he says in Philippians, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. That it's not just we keep our eyes focused on Jesus and watch what Jesus did or what Jesus said. We're to keep our eyes on each other who follow after the example of Jesus. We learn by watching each other. Last week I said that we're only able to serve each other as we are in family-like community where we know each other. Because we don't know each other's need unless we know each other. Unless there's a, a level of intimacy between us where we're able to share, admit our need to one another. And the, the same is true in terms of being examples to each other. We need to be in close proximity to each other, to be a, a model or a, a mentor to each other to model for each other what it looks like intentionally to follow after Jesus. There are a variety of ways that we are examples to each other. Some ways are very intentional. Other ways are much more casual. We might look to someone who is close by, who is a living model of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Someone that we admire. Not someone who's perfect, but someone who faithfully follows after Jesus. We'd call that person a model, an example to us. Somebody that we know, that we can spend time with, watch what they do, and, and learn from them. There are also historical models who we can look back to. You know, we quote people who are dead because they've set an example for us. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer or C.S. Lewis who become models to us of, of faith in action. There's also people who become models to us that we don't know, who it just seems like a random encounter, and you realize that is the exact person that I needed at that time in my life to show me what I was to become in Christ. The responsibility that we have in relationship with each other is to recognize that each of us is called to set an example for the other. That's a humble task that none of us are fit for. None of us deserve, but God calls us to be models to each other in community. And he also calls us to look for those people that we can imitate, that we can become like. I think parents understand this uh, acutely. They wonder who is it that is influencing 
uh, my children. No, no matter how old our, our kids are, we're looking for those people who are influencing our children. And we can be scared, nervous about the kinds of influences that our children have. And uh, we're nervous about the kind of influences, whether it's the media or friends at school or the teachers that they have, the coaches, and, and that's warranted in many cases. One of the things that, that um, a conviction that I've grown to uh, have over the years is that parents have so much more influence over their children simply because of the proximity of their relationship than they actually believe. Most parents think that they have no influence on their children because of the pushback that we get from our kids. And it starts late in life, like they're two years old, <laughs> where they begin to push back and you think, nobody's listening to me. I have no influence over this child. But studies continue to demonstrate that up until the age of about 15, parents are the number one influence on their child's decision-making process. If you were to ask a child, why did you make the decision you make? Because my parent said so, or this is what my parent believes. The vast majority of children make decisions based on their parents' values. And it's only until uh, students get into their later high school years that parents slip from number one to number two in influence. You know, the number one influence on an older teenager is their peers, which makes sense as our kids are developing that they need to find peers that they can relate to. That's an important part of their development. But parents don't drop from number one to, like, 90. Parents drop from one to two, which still says that we as parents have a great influence over our children because of the proximity of our relationship. That's true in our families, and it's also true in our spiritual family. That because of our proximity of relationship, because we know each other, we're able to set an example for each other, and that's how we grow. Now, I mentioned earlier that it's humbling to realize that we would be an example to anyone else because we all know that we, each of us knows that we are not perfect. Right? Did I miss somebody who walked in who is perfect today? When we're in, in leadership, when we're in relationship with one another, we don't set ourselves up as being perfect. I'm not a model of anything, any perfection to you, except who I am and what God has done in me. And the same is true for you. And just like in uh, relationships in our family, we learn from each other. We set examples to each other. Sometimes our children are examples to us. Sometimes we're examples to our children. You don't have to be perfect to be a model. We need to be someone who's intentionally following after Jesus. I remember when our boys were young and we were walking through Disneyland. I, I think they were five or six years old. And, you know, through Disneyland, it's a, kind of a scary experience to walk through with your kids. This is when you, you uh, want to take with you a roll of duct tape. Uh, to make sure that your kids don't get too far away from you. You just want to strap them onto you. You hold onto them tightly. Remember uh, Amy and I walking with the boys and remember watching their feet as we're, we're walking through Disneyland and, and their feet like trying to keep up with our strides that are bigger. That's sort of an image of how we model for each other walking with Christ. And to recognize there are others who are watching us and, and to understand the responsibility that we have to be examples to each other. So that's one. We're meant to grow together by being examples to each other. The second is we are meant to grow together by teaching each other. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing with God with gratitude in your hearts. We teach each other by passing on information to each other. Again, in, in intentional or casual settings. Some of the most intentional settings is when we are discipling one another, where someone with more mature faith on a regular basis sits down with someone who has less uh, maturity in Christ. And we disciple, we pass on information of faith 
to people who more casually uh, teach through coaching by giving occasional advice. But we are called to teach each other, to help each other grow by passing on information to each other, sharing wisdom with each other in formal and informal ways. And I think it's interesting that the image here that Paul uses in Colossians is that we, we admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. I think this image of singing together is an appropriate image of growing together, passing on information to each other, because teaching and learning is not just an individual experience. You know, this is actually the worst kind of teaching you could possibly do, what we're doing right now. One person talking to many. It's really not a very effective way of learning, unless you're taking notes, which many of you are. That's good. Filling in blanks, doing something active. Most of this kind of teaching is very passive. It's only until we begin communicating with each other about what we've heard and practicing what we've heard that we actually learn something. In this image of singing together, teaching each other through psalms and spiritual songs, is this image of the early church gathering together in order to remind each other through song of who God is and what God's called them to. There's a there's a communal response. As a matter of fact, some people think that this, is, uh, it, this it points to antiphonal singing where one side of the room sings and the other responds. You have this corporate experience of singing that passes on information to each other, that teaches one another through song. That's what we do in community. We learn from each other by sharing with each other, by communicating with one another by sharing insights and wisdom with one another. We teach each other. We help each other to grow. Third, we are meant to grow together by warning one another. <coughs> Hebrews 3.13 says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, the word encouragement in the New Testament is used many, many times. This sense in this passage is a sense of warning because of the urgency of today and the message that needs to be communicated. There's a warning. Matter of fact, uh, the message says, for as long as it's still God's today, keep each other on your toes so that sin doesn't slow down your reflexes. The, the Living Translation says, you must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardening against God. This word of encouragement has a sense of warning to it. I think that we serve, we help each other to grow by warning each other. And how does that happen? I think this is one of the great redeeming aspects of God's grace that we warn each other through experiences that we have had personally where we've experienced brokenness, grief, sadness. And God has taught us something through that experience. You know, the, the living out of Romans 8.28 that God works all things together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. The good is that we see how God has redeemed that situation in our lives. When we come before God and bring Him those situations in our lives that are, are broken, whether it's divorce or grief or illness, and we trust God with that, He does something in us that, that redeems that circumstance in our lives. And that becomes a, a word of warning to those around us. I think this is a wonderful part of God's grace in the, in the, in the context of community. That nothing is lost in God's economy. I was talking with Cindy Wright, our, our director of Mature Adults, who uh, informed me that we now have uh, 45 uh, members of our community who are over the age of 90. And we have over 200 who are over the age of 80. That's pretty amazing. We have people in our midst, 
who remember the first depression. You know, when we say this is the worst economic recession or depression in our lifetime, well, it depends on how old you are. <laughs> we have in our midst people who have learned lessons from that depression. And they tried to communicate those lessons to us for the last several decades, and we're not listening. Oh, you know, things like saving, being responsible, not living beyond your means. And now we listen to the wisdom of those who have experienced that before, and it makes sense to us. There are many of us who have experienced horrible tragedies in our lives that God uses, He redeems, in order for us to have empathy in the body. Because there are others who are going through exactly what we experienced. Now, that sense of warning isn't we come to church with a, a placard, a sign carrying a warning, look out. But as we're in relationship with one another, to be able to have empathy and compassion, mercy with each other, and to warn each other of what's ahead. Look out. Don't be fooled by the deceitfulness of sin. We warn each other. Last thing we do to help each other to grow. We're meant to grow together by encouraging each other. Now this word here uh, is not the sense of warning, but of building each other up. As it says in Colossians chapter 2 that we read earlier, that we would be built up. How is it that we're built up in the faith? By encouraging each other and building each other up, just as in fact you are doing. There's an aspect of encouragement that is showing acceptance to one another. And this is such a critical part of our growth because we live in a culture that is based on jabs and sarcasm and put-downs. Most sitcoms are based on really biting humor. And that infiltrates our relationships we say things that are cutting to each other. We don't even think anything of it because it was so creative and so funny. But God calls us to help each other to grow by building each other up, by using our words to accept one another and to build each other up. Proverbs 15.4 says, The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. I want to challenge us today to think of the words that we use with others that either put them down or build them up. And that God uses us in our families and our spiritual families to use words that remind each other of who we are in Christ. That we use words with each other that remind us who we are in Christ. Because I think we, believe, we live in a world where we easily forget who we are in Christ. So I just want to just random, random brainstorm here. What are the things that you want to be reminded of daily of what is true about who you are in Christ? What do you want to be reminded of every day? God has called us together in community to grow together in the way we set an example for each other, the way we teach each other, the way we warn each other, and the way we encourage each other so that we might be rooted and built up in Him and that we might more and more be conformed not to the image of each other. The goal is not to make us like each other, but to be conformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, from your perspective, it must be an awesome thing to look on this gathering of your followers and to see the uniqueness of each person that you've created fearfully and wonderfully, that you have gifted us, that you have saved us, you have graced us, you've empowered us, and that you've called us together to grow together. Not so that we can become more and more like each other, but so that we can be more and more like your son, Jesus. I pray, God, that you would build us up, that we would be rooted and established in you, 
that we would continue to live in Christ, become more and more like him. God, we pray your blessing on each of us, on our relationships with one another, that we would know each other and spur each other on. Thank you for your body, your family, and pray we'd be good stewards of all that you have given to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.